How are you doing this morning? Anybody good? Anyone tired? Anyone awake? Yeah, I'm all of those things. Uh, I was at camp this last week, like you heard, it was a great week. I'm running off of Red Bull uh, coffee and the Holy Spirit, so it should be a good morning, if you know what I mean, this morning. But I'm excited to share what God's put on my heart as we continue our series of Who You Say I Am. And I'm going to jump right into it this morning. And we're looking at the topic of chosen. I am chosen. Say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I know it can kind of sound cliche saying that you are chosen, but I think someone in here today is discouraged. And the things of the world that it has you down and has you doubting, did God really call me? Has God really chosen me? Is this all that, that life has for me? Is this all that God has for me? Is this what I'm experiencing right now in this marriage, all that there is to experience in marriage? It is is what this job I'm working all that, that there is to experience in life? And I came to tell you that God has more. We don't just live off of yesterday's bread, off of yesterday's manna. God has a new thing for us every single day. And I believe that for each one of us, God is calling us to do more. God is calling us for more. Whether you're, whether you're doing more now than what you've ever have or where, if you're struggling, God's got more. And Satan's come to tell you, stop. Stop. You're, you're not good enough. You're too old. Maybe when you were 20, maybe when you were 30, but what's God going to do with you in your 60s? What's God going to do with you after your second bankruptcy, after your second marriage? Like, you're, you're struggling because you've been applying to college because you feel like you're trying to follow God's will and you've been denied four times. You're struggling because you're, you're trying to fulfill the job that you feel like God's called you to, but you've been unemployed for the last year. But let me remind you that delay does not mean denial. Delay is not denial. Just because it's not happening how you want, when you want, does not mean it's going to happen. God has a plan for you. He has called you, and he has chosen you. And throughout this series, we've been looking at the truth of who God says we are, along with the lie of what Satan tries to tell us. And I think many times we try to believe both things, the truth and the lie. But hear me, when we begin to believe the truth, the lie disappears. The, the truth comes to the front. The truth this morning is this. No matter what you have been through, your own struggles, the, your, the things that you've put yourself through, the things other people have done to you, you are still chosen. God has not forsaken you. He has chosen you, and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Matthew 22, 14, you'll see on the screen, it says this, that many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited, but few are chosen. If you are here this morning, and you have accepted Jesus into your heart, you've declared him as Lord of your life, you are chosen. He has chosen you. It's like being out on the, on the recess kickball field, right? You are you're chosen. You're not the one that's standing there, the last one picked. You are chosen. You are first. He has declared that you are chosen, that he has a plan for you. Say, I am chosen. Say like you mean it. Don't sound, say like first service. Say, I am chosen. chosen. There we go. There we go. That's why low-key second er, service is my favorite. Don't tell first service. We're looking at... Jonah today. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Jonah. We're going to be going through chapter 1. Uh, but we see that Jonah was a man who was chosen. And, and I'm excited to walk you through the story of Jonah, what God's put on my heart for this morning. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the giant screen Bibles we have up on the, on the stage. It says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Atari. Um, that's not how you say it. I just don't know how to say it. So I thought Atari would be a good name for him. <laughs> so I want to I want to look at uh, break this down because uh, I think it's always good to ask. All right, what what am I reading here? Why why does it say this? So we see that the word came to Jonah. So why did the word come to Jonah? We see that Jonah he was a prophet. His his call his job was to listen to God. Was was for God to speak to him, and then he would tell the people. What's awesome is this: is that today. If you make yourself available, God will speak to you. God, God, will, God will tell you things. He'll begin to preach to you in your life. And, and we see that the word came to Jonah. What, and I want to see what does the name Jonah mean? The, the name Jonah means dove. If you uh, don't know me very well, uh, a fun fact about me is I am terrified of birds. Birds are my biggest fear. Anybody with me? Like birds are scary to you. All right? Two people. That's great. <laughs> it's a real thing, all right? Like I don't know why... I'm scared of birds. I, if you were to ask me, like, why you see, I, I don't know why. There wasn't, like, a, a time where, like, I got attacked by birds or anything like that. But when you think about it, you can't escape birds. Like, if you're outside, you're vulnerable. 
Like they can just swoop down. They're faster than you. They can swoop and attack and poop. And, and they, it, you just, they're unpredictable. Like snakes, yeah, they're scary too, but I can jump up on like a chair and get away from a snake. Birds, they're just coming after you. Uh, so we see that, that Jonah means, means dove. And although birds are terrible, disgusting, they got a bird over there. That's great. Although birds are terrible, disgusting, horrible creatures, something interesting about doves is that they can sense when a storm is coming. Uh, they can sense when danger is coming and f fly away before it comes. And I want to ask you this question this morning. What are you running from that you should be running to? What are you running from that you should be running to? Because I don't know about you, but no longer do I want to run away from the things that God has called me to. No longer do I want to run away from the things that God's placed on my heart that, that he's given me a passion for because it seems scary, because it seems difficult, because it's, it puts me out of my comfort zone. I want to run to those things. Because we need to realize that I, that I am chosen. Realize that this morning that you are chosen and your past does not disqualify you. Your past doesn't disqualify you. I think many times we, we, we get caught up in, the, in testimony, and we think, well, my past uh, has ruined me. Maybe you've struggled with different things, with, with drugs and, and alcohol, and, and just going through life in, in difficult situations. You say, well, I've, I've done all this. No way can God use me. Guess what? God's going to use your testimony to reach someone. And, and there's the, the reverse, where maybe you're here this morning, and, and you've had a great life. You've followed God your whole life. You've never struggled with anything like a, an addiction or anything like that. You say, well, what testimony do I have? Like, God, like, I, haven't, I don't have anything cool to share. That is a testimony that you haven't struggled with that, that you haven't got caught up in that, and that can can be used to reach people. You're, there's power in your testimony. So Jonah's name, it, it, it's dove, and doves fly away uh, when danger comes. And I want you to realize that there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us, isn't there? A little bit of, of when, when fear comes, when, when something gets difficult, we kind of take a step back. We, we don't always just go straight for it. Because knowing that you're, that you're chosen, that's, that's easy. But it, it's easy also to get distracted uh, with, with the lies, with, with things that Satan puts at us. You see, when Satan knows that you know you're chosen, Sa Satan already knows you're chosen, Satan already knows you're called, but when he sees that you begin to live out that calling, when you begin to live out what God's declared for your life, he gets scared. So what does he try to do? He tries to destroy you. He tries to tear you down. He tries to, to make sure that you don't ever want to continue living out that calling, and if he can't destroy you, he's going to distract you. And it might be good things, it might be bad things that he puts in your way that pull you away from God. And if he can't destroy you, if he can't distract you, he's going to make you doubt. So we see he destroys, he distracts, and he makes us doubt. Listen, doubt and, and having questions is not bad. What you do with it can be. When you have questions, when you have doubt, you don't have to be fearful. Like, I can't talk about this doubt. I can't talk about these questions because people might think of me differently. So what can happen is then we go to Google, right? And we search, who knows that Wikipedia ain't going to give you the best answers all the time when you got questions about God. What, what you do with your doubt can, can be very uh, instrumental in, in your walk with God. When you open up your word instead of opening up your laptop to search, that's when good things can begin to happen. But remember, you are chosen. Say, I am chosen. Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, it says this, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. The first thing we discover in Jonah that you're going to discover in your walk with God is this, is God doesn't always tell you to do things that you like. God doesn't always tell you to do things you like. If you've been around church for a long time, if you've grown up in church, we know that Jonah kind of gets a bad rap, right? Like, we think, like, what a dingus Jonah is. Like, look at this guy. God told him to go and, and to do this, and he does the total opposite. What a jamoke. Like, this guy, this guy is crazy. Like, look at me. I, look at me. I wouldn't do that, God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't run away from what you call me to. But really, when we think about it, there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. Jonah had a legitimate reason that he did not want to go to Nineveh. Little history lesson for you. Anybody here like history? History was like my favorite class in school. I wasn't very good at it, but it was my favorite class. Uh, we see that Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Jonah is from Israel. Israel and Assyria were enemies. So what we see is God's calling Jonah to go to his enemies. Assyria uh, was a very brutal uh, group of people. They were, they were very mean and vicious. They were crazy. All right, say they were cray-cray. They were cray-cray. They would go into cities and they would burn the whole place down, killing everyone. They would kill people by burying them in the ground, leaving just their head above the ground until they died. 
Then they would take all the skulls of everyone that they just killed in the city and pile them up outside the city so everyone walking by would know that they had been there. They're crazy people. So when God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, he's not like, uh, you know what, God, I, I know that, that you want me to go there, but right now my schedule, it's just busy, and I, I, like, it's, just, it's, it's not really going to work out. No, when God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, he's like, oh, snap. Like, you want me to go where and talk to who? I don't, I don't think that's right, God. And now we can see why he, why he did what he did. So when Jonah gets this word from God, he, he's like, I don't want to do this. Listen, God's going to call you to do some things that you don't want to do, some places you don't want to go, talk to some people that you don't want to talk to, and he's going to put you in places that maybe make you uncomfortable. And maybe you feel like, well, I, I, I'm not qualified to do this. Guess what? No one really is because God wants you to realize that you can't do it on your own. He wants you to trust in him. He doesn't want you to go into a situation thinking, oh, I can do this. I got this. He's, he wants you to go into a situation and say, I can do all things through Christ. We can do it through Jesus. You're not going to feel comfortable. You're not going to feel qualified. But through God, you will be made qualified. You may have a legitimate reason that you don't want to do what God is calling you to do. And maybe, maybe you've been slowly working at it and you're just waiting for the right time to do what God's called you to do. But remember this, that delayed obedience is still disobedience. Yeah. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. I think of it like, like this, a mom with her children, right? And maybe this is you or our dad with his kids. Maybe this is you or maybe this was even you this morning and it's gonna bring back bad memories from this morning where maybe you need to ask for forgiveness uh, for, but I picture it like a mom with her son, and she's trying to get little Johnny to put his shoes on, right? She's like, all right, little Johnny, time to put your shoes on. Johnny doesn't want to put his shoes on. Johnny, one. Johnny, time to put your shoes on. Two. John, two and a half, right? Anybody been there? Any parents been there before calling out, or any kids been there where your parents calling you out on that? I think many times this is us with God, where we're just waiting like, all right, God, I'm not ready yet, not ready, nope, nope, you're going to wait, you're going to go to 2.6, 2.7, right? You're, we're just waiting, thinking like, all right, I'm going to go at the last second possible. And this is us with our walk with God, or we're sitting there waiting for God to call us to do something that we like. Well, let me tell you, if you're waiting, I think maybe some people are here this morning that are waiting to hear a word from God that they like or that they want to do. Guess what? If that's you, you might just be waiting forever. You might be waiting forever to get a word from God that you like, that, that sounds easy, that you want to do. And, and Christians, we can be hilarious because we pick and choose what things we want to obey from God. We, we can pick and choose. I picture it like a football team. And imagine you're the running back on the football team, all right? So everybody imagine that. You're the running back on the Detroit Lions because they're the best team. Uh, and you're, you're the running back on this football team. And the coach calls the play. And you know that that play means that the ball's getting handed off to you and you're running. So, and you're like, uh, actually, actually, coach, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sit this one out. Right? Who knows the coach is going to be like, uh, why are you sitting this one out? You're like, well, it's funny you ask because... Uh, well, last time we ran this play, I got the ball handed to me, and I got hit, I got tackled, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and sit this one out. But hear me, maybe if you're willing to get hit, maybe if you're willing to get tackled, your team might actually be able to score a touchdown. I think there are more, more times than not, there are many Christians who are more concerned about getting hit and about getting tackled than they are about scoring a touchdown. But that, but that play might be the play that your coach wants and that your team needs. I'm preaching to myself this morning. I hope that you are okay with me preaching out of a place of transparency, that this is something that I need to hear too. I'm not going to preach to you something that I don't want to do too, something that I'm not, I'm not struggling with too, but this is something that I pray that New Hope would, would realize, that God's going to call us to do some things that we don't want to do, but that we would be willing to get hit, that we'd be willing to, to take a hit, to, to get tackled, realizing that this might be the exact play that God needs us to run that this might be the exact thing that, that we need as a team to, to have happen. And, and maybe you're like, all right, Pastor Zach, you know, I, I, can, I can get that. I can, I can take the ball. I can, I can handle getting hit because, you know what, I might score a touchdown. And you know, Pastor Zach, I've been working on my little touchdown dance, right? I don't know how to floss, but you got your touchdown dance that you're ready to do. And you're like, oh, I'm going to, I got the touchdown dance ready to go. But hear me, it's not, your calling is not for your glory, it's for God's glory. God gets the glory out of it. And we, we need to go in a situation realizing that I'm going to do this for God. 
So, I, so we see that Jonah, he gets called uh, to do something that, that he doesn't want, and maybe that's you. You're called to do something that you don't want to do. You don't understand it. It doesn't really make sense to you. And, and because, you, because you realize that you're like, I don't, I don't want to do this, I don't like doing this, I don't even fully understand why I do it, maybe I, shouldn't just, maybe I should just not obey it. But I want to look at some different Bible, uh, Bible characters here who, who have maybe gone through very similar things, where God called them to do something that maybe they didn't want to do. We see David and Goliath, right? Do you think this 13-year-old boy with three armpit hairs and a voice crack wanted to fight against a giant? I don't think so. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you think they woke up that morning like, hey, 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 got an idea. Let's go hang out in the furnace today, huh? I know we usually go to the sauna after we work out, but what about the furnace today? That sounds great, doesn't it? No, they didn't wake up thinking that. Do you think Daniel wanted to get thrown into the lion's den? Abraham, after waiting a hundred years for a child, do you think he wanted to sacrifice Isaac at the altar? Jesus, a man who knew no sin, do you think he wanted to go to the cross? He said, my flesh is weak, but my spirit is willing. What God's looking for is two things, faith and obedience. He's looking for you to have faith that that he's got it, faith that he's going to take care of it, and your obedience to step out and actually do it. Hear me, New Hope, God wants to use you for his glory to accomplish something great. And when that word comes to you, and let me tell you, God's going to be coming to you with a word. It may be intimidating, it may be scary, you may not understand it, but it's going to end out better than you could have ever imagined. Do you believe that you are chosen this morning? Say, I am chosen. Verse 3 says, but Jonah, the dove, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Here's what I want you to see from this verse is that there will always be a boat headed in the wrong direction. There will always be, when God calls you, when God speaks to you, there's always going to be a boat headed in the wrong direction direction. So God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. Little geography lesson for you this morning. I'm just like, I'm just your teacher today, all right? Kids that are on summer break, you're learning, all right? It's great. Uh, Nineveh was 500 miles from where Jonah was. Where he wanted to go, Tarshish, was 2,500 miles in the opposite direction, five times the distance. How many know that sometimes it takes more work disobeying God than it does obeying God, right? Like, we, like it's a lot, sometimes it can be much more difficult, take much more effort. It's exhausting because some of y'all, you get creative with your sin, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. You get creative. Like, you got fake social media accounts so you can go and comment on people's stuff without them knowing it's you. You hop on Facebook and you, you say some mean stuff to people and then you're trying to avoid them in person. Like, you got to keep all your lies straight. How many know it takes a second lie to reinforce the first lie? right? It's exhausting. Students, you're like sneaking out, you get caught by your dad, and you're like, dad, the funny thing is here is I was praying and I just fell out the window. Like, <laughs> you, you're just like, you trying to, you're like, it's biblical. It happened in the Bible, dad. Check it out. God calls Jonah to go 500 miles. He says, no, I'm going to go 2,500, five times that, the opposite direction. When God calls us to do something, there will always be a boat going the opposite way. That's why maybe students, you, you come up to the altar on a Wednesday night, you say, I want to I wanna quit talking back to my parents. I want to start respecting my parents. And you have a great moment, and then you go home, and mom and dad say something to you, and you get defensive and snap right back. That's why maybe you're here this morning, and you have a, a significant other, a boyfriend, a girlfriend that you know that you aren't supposed to be with. That God said, hey, that they're not for you. I've got, a, I've got a different person in mind. And you might come up this morning, and you might be praying about it. God speaks to you. you. You need to cut things off. But there's always going to be a boat going the opposite direction because that boy or that girl, he's going to come to you and he's going to be like, hey, hey girl, guess what? God called me to you today, right? Like, no. <laughs> like, there's always going to be a boat going the opposite direction. Maybe it's more simple like this. You're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to start eating healthier. And then someone brings cookies to work and you're like, all right, I got to, right? Maybe you're, you're, you want to stop listening to a certain type of music and then that new album, it, it comes out. Maybe you want to stop swearing, and then you, you're walking around, you stub your toe, and that word comes out, right? Whatever it is, there's always going to be a boat headed in the opposite direction. And I want you to realize this, that just because there appears to be multiple options to get you to your calling does not mean there are multiple ways. There's only one way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. There's one way to get you there. 
So I want to give you uh, three things that will keep you from getting in the wrong boat uh, and, and remind you that you're chosen. So that was my whole introduction. I'm only going to preach to you for another three hours or so, if that's cool with you this morning. Uh, no, I, if you're taking notes this morning, I'm sorry. I wrote this at camp, like I said, and I was, I was drinking a lot of Red Bull, and I don't think there's really points this morning, but here you go. Three things that will keep you from getting on the wrong boat and remind you that you are chosen. The first one is this, intimacy with God. Yeah. Intimacy with God. Into me see. Where you really evaluate who is God. Who is God? Not just what you hear about on Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night, but you really taking time to get to know who is God. What are, what are the traits of God? But not just you realizing who God is, but you also taking time to, for God to let you get to know who you are. For him seeing into you, evaluating you, calling you out. How do we get intimate with God? It's prayer, right? Talking with God, letting him talk to us. Prayer, intimacy with God, number one. Number two is this Bible application. Reading your Bible is great, but many times I think lots of us get caught up where we read a chapter and we're like, sweet, done with that. All right, don't know what, how I apply that to my life, but I read my Bible for the day. But Bible application is key. And maybe you're like, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Well, I want to give you this thing called soap. Hopefully you used it this morning and the person next to you isn't smelling you. But when I do my devotional, this is how I do my devos. I write soap down the side of the page. The S stands for scripture, all right? So if we're walking through today's soap, we're going to write Jonah chapter 1. Easy, right? You already got one of four steps done. This is easy. Oh, observation. What did I see happen? What happened in this verse? Today we'd see Jonah, Jonah's a dingus. A, application. How do I apply what I read to my life? Don't be like Jonah, right? <laughs> or what? Hopefully you go a little more in-depth than that. And P, prayer. I think it's valuable that we write our prayers down. If, if you're not journaling, if you don't write down what you're praying about, how do you remember when God answered your prayers? Because many times I think we, we pray about something, and we're, we're praying about it, and then we move on, and we kind of forget about it, and God answered it a different way than what we thought, but we didn't really realize that he answered it. But it's valuable that when you can go back and remind yourself that God was faithful all along, and that he answered that prayer, and this prayer, and this prayer, that God is there, and he is faithful with you. The last thing that we see is, is having, and I, I don't know what happened to this slide. It disappeared from the time I made it to the time I got to the computer, but it's this community with believers. Community with believers. What will keep you from the wrong boat and what will help you get in the right boat is having those key friends, those key leaders, those key mentors in your life that, that surround you. Notice this, Jonah, he's a prophet. His call, his job is to hear from God and share it with people. When he's running, he goes down to, to Joppa and he finds the ship crew. Not a New Hope small group, not a, a, a friend that knows his calling, not people who, who are close to him and know what God has called him to do, just some random group of people. And what happens is this, is that we are not intentional with the people we surround ourselves with. We're not intentional with the, the key people that, that we're putting in our lives. And we just float around from group to group going to whoever will accept me, whoever, whoever will love on me. Listen to this, if, if, you, if you do not know where you're going, people will be glad to take you where they are headed. If you do not make it known, if you do not know where, where you're going, people are just going to take you along. They're going to take you wherever they are going. And some, someone maybe here today is in a situation where you're struggling and you're in a relationship and you're saying, I don't want to be in this relationship. I don't want to be this person. I don't want to talk this way. I don't want to treat people this way. I don't want to be known by that. And I want to ask you this question. Would your situation be different if you were more intentional with the people you surrounded yourself with? Would the struggles, would the things, the trials that you're going through in your life, would those look different if you were more intentional with the people that are around you? We, what happens is we just float through life going from, from person to person, group to group. And I'm not telling you don't have a lot of friends, okay? I think it's important that we have friends. But what I think we need to do is we need to be intentional with who we are close to. Ask, your, ask yourself this question, who really knows me? Who really knows what God's called me to do? Does anyone know who, what God's called you to do? Is the person that knows, are they going to be strong enough to call you out on something? We need to have those relationships with people that, that they will keep us accountable. Yeah. We're going to continue reading starting in verse 4, and we're going to read all the way through verse 17 here. So if you'd follow along, verse 4 it says, The Lord sent a great wind on the sea. 
Such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Maybe, maybe you need to realize this, that maybe your storm is a setup. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Are you sleeping on your calling this morning? The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who was responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah, verse 8. So they asked him, tell us, who was responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, if, you have, if you're reading in your Bible, I want you to underline verse 9. It says this, he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. We'll get back to that. Verse 10, this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? This part just is crazy to me. They knew he was running from the Lord because he had already told them so. He's quicker to tell them that he's running from God than to tell the people of Nineveh that he came from God. 11. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm, and I know that this is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. 15, then they, they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. That will preach right there, that even when we're disobeying God, even when we're going against God, people can still see Jesus in us. Someone write that down. Give that to me later. We'll preach that a different week. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. I want you to see this, that God may use a storm to wake you up. God may use a storm to wake you up. This story may look very similar to us, what, what our past looks like, what our future could lo look like. Jonah gets this word from God that he doesn't like, that, that he doesn't want to do. It's hard. It's scary. And I don't know what God's called you to do today, what God's called you to do with your life, but maybe you've been delaying it. Maybe that's, maybe that's inviting a friend to church, preaching to your lunchroom, uh, giving more to missions, uh, giving up swearing, drinking, uh, music, movies, an addiction, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. He's told you to do something and you just keep delaying it. It's like that mom, what, one, two, two and a half, and that's where we're at with God. But Jonah, he, he went and he hired a boat. He hired a group of people to take him the opposite way. And I'm sure he's thinking, it's going to get easier the farther I get from here. But how many know you can run from God, but you can't hide from God? Anybody glad that you can't hide from God, that even in your struggles you can run from him, but he's still going to come and he's going to find you? We see that Jonah, he gets on board. He, go, he goes below deck and he falls asleep. How many of us are, are sleeping on what God has called us to do? And, and God comes in and he gets this storm and he, he wakes him up from this sleep, from this slumber. But what I love is that this storm doesn't just wake up Jonah physically, it wakes him up spiritually. Look at verse 9, the one I had you underline, it said, He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. He reminds himself of who he is. He reminds himself that he is called by God. Could it be that what you are calling your setback, God is calling his setup? Could it be what you are calling your punishment, God is calling a platform? Could it be what you're saying, this is my biggest trial, God's saying, just get ready because this is going to be my biggest testimony. God's got plans for you, and while it may look different than what you want it to have happen, maybe your setback is actually a setup, and God's setting you up to win. Say, I am chosen. Say, I am chosen. God chose Jonah. He called him to go to Nineveh, and he does the opposite. He goes totally against what God wanted him. And I'm sure that when the storm starts coming up, when they start talking about who, whose fault it is, when Jonah gets thrown overboard and he does like a perfect swan dive into the water, the fish comes and swallows him up, I'm sure he's sitting there thinking, God's forsaken me. This is my punishment. To, like, God's left me. No way do I have a chance to, to, to get back again. He's He's gone. What appeared to be the most dangerous place was getting thrown overboard. 
really was the safest place for Jonah because it was the first time he was actually back in the will of God. I have my friend Kirk here with me today. Kirk is one of our, our youth leaders at NH Youth. If you ask any of the students or leaders, Kirk is one of the favorites among everyone. But Kirk has a story, a testimony that he wants to share with you this morning. This is my Jonah story. At age 11, in 1973, I was saved at a church camp in Clear Lake, Iowa. The following year at the same camp, I believe the Lord called me into the ministry. The counselor emphatically told me to tell our pastor right away when I returned home from camp. I never told him. The only person I told was my mom. So from 1974 to 1988, 14 long years, I was lost in the world and not following God. Then in 1988, I returned to the church because Brenda, who is now my wife, I was dating at the time, and I wasn't very nice to her, so she told me she was done with me unless I got right. God began working in me. In 1989, Brenda and I were married and then began our search for a church, and then we landed here at New Hope in 1991. God began a work in me when I got here at New Hope. He began that journey and he helped me to seek his forgiveness. Even though he had forgiven me for not answering his call when I was 12, deep down inside, I had not forgiven myself. It was not until six years ago at camp at the age of 50 so for 32 years, this was deep down inside of me. So when I was at camp six years ago with the middle schoolers at Lake Geneva, where you guys just came back from, that God revealed to me that I needed to forgive myself. One night at camp, the speaker turned the tables on me in particular, and he had all the counselors come to the altar to be prayed for by the students. It was an eighth grade student from New Hope that laid his hands on me and prayed for me. How fitting is that? I was called into the ministry at camp and restored at camp. I believe that part of God's restoration plan for me is to serve others that are at the age that I veered off course. That's why at the age of 56, I serve with NH Youth. And should the Lord will it, I one day will be the oldest youth leader in the country. <laughs> I would like to leave you with this verse and, and, and then a question. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So let me unpack that for you. He's called us for his glory and goodness. He has everything that we need. We just need to know him. We need to spend time with him. And that divine power is available to you. So my question to you is, what do you think would happen if individually and collectively we sought God's knowledge and his calling on our lives. Thank you, Kirk. If you would stand. <laughs> saw that the name Jonah, it means dove. And we saw that, that doves fly away when danger is coming, when a storm is coming. But I think it's important to see uh, another symbol that a dove represents which is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will give you power. 
My prayer this morning is that we would seek after the Holy Spirit, that we'd seek after uh, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that we would get the power that God has for us to go into our community, to go into our workplace, to go into our families, to go into the schools and tell people about Jesus, to fulfill the calling that God has for our lives. There's power. God wants to give you this power. I don't know about you, I don't know what your name means, but I think it's time that we stop listening to what the world thinks about us and start listening to what God says about us. God's calling you this morning. He has a call and a plan for you. And maybe you, maybe you have uh, call, been called to something, God has chosen you for something, and you've been running from that calling. And much like Kirk, maybe, maybe you just kind of fell away from it, and now you've, you live feeling guilty. But hear me, that you are not forsaken. God has not forsaken you. He has chosen you. He has a plan for you. Just because you went through a trial, God's now using that for a testimony. God has big things in store for you. Maybe the things of the world have you down, and and all you hear is the names that the world says to you. But hear me, God's not afraid to change your name. See, Saul to Paul, Abram to Abraham. Maybe the world says that you're lazy, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're an accident, you are ugly, but God says you are beautiful. You are smart. You are worth knowing. You are worth having. You are chosen. God has chosen you for such a time as this. And what I, what I love about this story and what I love about where all of us are right now is that your story isn't over yet. The story isn't over yet. If you continue reading, which I challenge you, continue reading this chapter the rest of the day, or throughout today some point, it'll take you 20 minutes to read the rest of this book of Jonah. But we see the story's not over yet. You see, God's got a great sense of humor, doesn't he? he the, the fish that swallowed Jonah took him up and threw him up at Nineveh. That's great. I love that, that that's in there. Jonah goes into Nineveh, tells the people about Jesus, and everybody turns from their evil ways. God has a plan for you. The story isn't over. Maybe what you're viewing as a punishment, God is viewing as a platform for you. My prayer today is that God would call you, that you would feel the calling of of God on your life, that, that you would be in tune, that you would be listening, and maybe that looks different for everyone. Maybe that's someone kind of speaking life into you. Maybe that's an audible voice you hear from God, but that you would just have a calling, that you would have a, a, a knowledge of what God wants for you, that you would seek after His Holy Spirit here, tomorrow, every day, because each day God's got new things for us. But let's go after God. Let, let's go after all that He has for us. I don't want to get to the end of my life realizing, I, I, sh- I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have done this. God's got plans for you. If you would bow your head and, and, and close your eyes. This morning, as, as I was talking about how you are chosen, and if, if you've accepted Jesus into your life, that you are one of his chosen, that, that, that you are picked by him. And if that's you and you're saying, I want to be chosen by God today, I want to accept Jesus into my life, declaring him as Lord of my life. If that's you this morning and you, you want to make that decision to welcome Jesus into your life, would you just raise your hand? No one looking around. See your hands. The other, the other thing I want to hit on is this, is today you're saying, I want to live out my calling. I want to live out what, what God has chosen me for. I want to seek after his Holy Spirit. I don't, want to, I don't want to run from the things that God has for me. Rather, I want to run to them. If that's you this morning saying, I want to run to the things God has for me, would you raise your hand? My hand is up on this. God, I pray I would not run from the things that you've called me to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, and we're just going to have a a, a few minutes here as we close just to seek after God, to seek after the Holy Spirit, to be listening. God, what are you calling me to? I pray that God will put faces in your mind. He'll put names on your heart, that he'll put locations. Maybe someone here is called to ministry today. Maybe someone is called to missions today, whatever that may be, that we'd search after God for all that he has for us. Dear Jesus, I thank you for every person here this morning, that you have them here for a purpose, God, that you have a, a, a... calling on their life, God. I pray that we would begin to have a knowledge of what that calling is, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall in this place, God, that we'd be filled, that we'd be baptized with your Holy Spirit, that we would encounter you, God. God, fill us up with something new today, God. We don't want to live off of yesterday's manna. We don't want to live off of last Sunday, God. We don't want to live off of what you did at camp, God. I pray that that for students coming back from camp, that camp would not be the ceiling, but it would be the new floor, God. I pray you would do something new, God. I pray that you would start revival in this city, God, that you would use students, adults, God, those who are are 10 years old, those who are 80 years old, God, to reach more people for you, God. I pray we would live out our calling knowing that we are chosen by you. Amen.